we are recording. All right. I'm so thrilled today to be here with Alessandro Mazzinghetti, aka the Map Man. Um, Alessandro's work, of course, to me is is massive in in the current moment of of Italian wines. Um, his detailed terroir mapping of Italy's greatest regions is um, a really important tool to all of us who love wine. He has 3D maps of Barolo, Barbaresco, Chianti, Bulgari, um, detailed paper maps of an extraordinary array, array of terroirs. Um, sorry, I'm continuing to mute people, um, including Lugana, Orvieto, Niza, Gattinara, Valtellina, Valpolicella, Vino Nobile, Dolviani, and more. Um, and also some French, Sauterne and Bordeaux included. Um, I'm gonna add in the useful e-travel e-books, which you can travel with, um, which are so such handy tools. Um, and his print books, Barolo MGA volumes one and two are arguably represent some of the most important work on, on Italy's most lauded um, appellation. So um, Barbaresco MGA in the works, not currently available I'm, as if I understand correctly. Um, and today we're gonna also take a look at, the at Alessandro's dynamic uh, drone mapping project, Barolo MGA 360. So um, obviously I'm just thrilled to have Alessandro here with me today. Um, his the paper maps, uh, many of them that I own are just very uh, love-worn from, from use. So we'll talk also about how to use those maps um, because they're different than other maps. Um, but I want to set up um, a little bit framework for the inquiry that we're making today. So uh, those of you who know me know that I'm a wine historian and I am interested in the why and how of um, of a place, its past, and how that shapes its present, and you know what's happening right now. So I want to give just a little bit of um, of context for how I see the contemporary moment in Italy, um, in Italy's wine today. Um, so the Italic Peninsula has this rich and conti contiguous complex history for over three thousand years of wine, um, but despite great highs during the Roman Empire and um, and the Renaissance period in, in parts of Italy, the history of wine is really complicated. And um, largely that's because the political history of Italy has been was fragmented from the fall of Rome to the unification of Italy in 1861. And that is almost 13 centuries, right? So for 13 centuries, uh, we have different political histories in each of the regions. And on top of this incredible topography that divides those regions up and separates people. And right as Italy was unifying, of course, we had the phylloxera wine blight and the great um, wine shortage in France, which impacted Italy in a lot of ways, especially in the south and Campania and Puglia by um, creating in those regions um, a demand for cheap wine, right, to supply to the north. So this, these historical events interrupt uh, those regions quest to understand their terroir and make the very best expression of, of their place that they possibly can and push those people to make uh, lots of wine as opposed to good wine, right? That's the age old problem. Um, <clears throat> and then additionally, I think an interesting factor that brings us to the, why this moment that we're in right now is in my mind, a, a renaissance or a rebirth of um, maybe the greatest period of Italian wine yet, is that up until the 1960s, uh, the law of the land was basically sharecropping. So the, this concept called mesandria, where we had you know, great land owners and people, little people who worked the land, not big and little people, but you know what I mean, um, that this caused a disincentive for your average grower to make the very best wine they could make, right? They needed food. To survive, right? And they had to pay a part of that to the landowner. And so that practice wasn't abolished until the 1960s, which is shocking, really, in the context of contemporary Western history. And so really, from the 1960s to present, we are, it, Italy's wines are exploding in this rebirth moment, where um, we have domains and small producers who are making their own wine, questing to understand their land, right? It's their land now. 
Um, so this is really important. And um, I think that for me, um, the idea of mapping now is, is, is you know, is, is part of that moment. You know, in Burgundy, as you, a lot of you know me as a Burgund Burgophile or however you want to call it, they've been mapping their land for 1500 years. And that has a very different kind of impact on, on the people and the wines that are produced. So um, I want to explore with Alessandro today the, the, the impact um, in this moment of, of mapping and understanding Italy's great terroirs. So with that said, um, I'm going to finally give over the floor to Alessandro because I know that we're here to listen to him and not me. But um, I want to start with asking Alessandro um, how you see mapping in this historical arc of, um, of the evolution of the MGA and Italy's great terroirs. So, uh, well, first of all, <coughs> I want to say hello, everybody. And thank you so much, Tanya, for this opportunity. I'm really happy to be here. So your question is, is, not, is not easy. Uh, I believe that uh, map making in this moment is really important, but on, not only in this moment, because uh, I have to say that uh, I started my mapping project a long time ago long time ago, uh, it's, it's, it's maybe too much, but I started my mapping project in 1994, so uh, almost 26 years ago. And uh, this is very important because I, I remember perfectly that period because uh, I, I was working with Luigi Veronelli at that time. And um, Luigi Veronelli was the most important wine journalist and food journalist uh, in Italy at that time and he created the wine critics profession, I have to say. So I was working with him and I had in mind this project to map the region of Barbaresco. And he was really enthusiastic about this project. So we started, I pro we produced a map of, of, of Barbaresco, but uh, he printed, I, don't, I do not remember how many copies he printed, but something, something like, I have 5,000 copies, something like this, no? A lot. And uh, I suppose that he sold maybe 50 copies uh, overall <laughs> and all the other copies remain in the, in the warehouse. So we look in the eyes of each other and we said, maybe it's not the right moment. <laughs> just, to, just, to, just to tell you how things can change in, in, in only 25 years. So because now it's completely different and I believe that map making is really important to uh, put the tradition on, on paper uh, because uh, what is important to understand is that almost in every wine region in Italy, we have a tradition about the best vineyards uh, for, each, for each appellation. Uh, unfortunately, this tradition uh, was something uh, connected to the to the community, to the local community, but it was never um, the only one that made map about this was Renato Latti, okay? And it was in 75, 74, something like this. And, uh, you know, I, that's why I decided to, 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 to start to map, to, to map making because uh, it's, a, it's the best way to, to fix and to communicate the tradition of, of an area and to make uh, also the producer uh, conscious of their own tradition because that, that, the, the, uh, sometimes they under-evaluate their, their tradition. They do not believe that they are important. While in my opinion, it's really, really important to, 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 to bring this tradition to the surface and is a tradition, uh, about about the single names of the area, about the crews, and for example, in Barolo, you know, we, we you talk about the Mezzadria, and it is perfect. But at that time, even at that time during the Mezzadria, there were big sellers like Prunotto, like Pio Cesare, like Bonardi, and some others that made wine Barolo, and there were people that were charged to buy grapes in the area, you know? And those people knows 
knew perfectly where the best vineyard were. Mm -hmm. But the problem at that time that the, the market was in the end of this big seller and their goal was not to produce a single vineyard, a Barolo, okay, or was to produce a brand wine. So a wine that tastes for, uh, as a Pernotto wine, as a Bonardi wine. And uh, I want to come back to Luigi Veronelli and remember that this person was really important in this um, uh, idea to create a culture about, about uh, um, the vineyards, because in the, at the end of the 50s, he wrote a book about the, the was one of the first wine books uh, in Italy. And he started to push the producer and say, you have to start to vinify as a single vineyard, but not only in Barolo, everywhere in Italy. And this is, in my opinion, very important because everything started from this book and from the article of this person. And I, I remember that uh, when I started to work with him, there was, a, a, um, uh, I don't know the word in English, but anyway, uh, he repeated every time a, a story that when he went to France uh, to taste the wine, he met a, a, a vigneron and a famous vigneron, I do not remember the name, and this vigneron said, oh, you in Italy, no, we in France, we have uh, silver uh, vineyards and we make golden wines. In Italy, you have golden vineyards and you make silver wines. <laughs> and this place really remained in the, yeah, in, the, in the mind of Luigi Veronelli for all his life. And this is, this is really the starting point of, of, of the single vineyard vinification and in my opinion of map making as well. Wow. I, I don't want that's, That's such an impress. No, I love that story. It's so um, evocative. Um, silver vineyards and golden wine, or golden vineyards and silver wine. <laughs> um, so Luigi Veronelli was was he? His work was associated with travel. Is that did his his book was about travel tourism? Is that correct, or am I am no, I wrong about no, that? No, 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 no. He came from philosophy. It <laughs> was it was. A, uh, when he was young, he was a um, was a, uh, was a publisher, but not about wine. And uh, this is a little story. It was <laughs> the last Italian publisher to have a, a book burned on the public square. <laughs> <laughs> really? He, he was so proud of this because uh, he has some picture of this event and all the books burning on the square and it was fantastic. Uh, but then after this, uh, he started to, to write about wine and food and that's all. Yes, you know, uh, travel is part of, of wine and food. You, you cannot split wine from travel. Uh, it's always connected in my opinion because when you are a wine lover, you need to go to the region where where the wine comes from. Um, yeah, yeah. If you can. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this so, is a. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, no, no, no. So this is a great moment to kind of talk about the cultural heritage of place, the collective information that brings us to where we are, where you could make a map, and I'm interested also in the names of the crew, the names. Um, and I wanted to ask you about how much what came before you influence, how it influences where you begin with your work. Oh, and wondering yeah. if you could also oh, weave in the yeah. names. So uh, I have to say that only in Barolo, Barbaresco, Valpolicella, and partially in Chianti Classico, uh, the work that the tradition that uh, was before me uh, was important um, because um, there were, for example, I, I said before, there were the maps from Renato Ratti. So the, this was a starting, a real, a very important starting point. If you look at this map now, maybe they look simple, uh, 
uh, compared to my to my map, but uh, in my opinion, they are on the same level. Are uh, this map are really important, and I I if if you want to start to learn about uh, Barolo and Barbaresco, you have to buy the, the maps from from Arena Torati because you and, and compare this map with my map to see how things are, are changed along the years. Because if you look at the map of Renato Ratti, you can see that some crews that now are very, very famous are not cited, mm. are, are not present on the map. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can make many, many, you can tell a lot of story about this. Uh, sometimes people say they are not, they were not on the map because they are, they were, they are not important. No, this is not the, the right answer in my, in my opinion. And uh, uh, you talk before about Mezzadria, so we have to remember that at that time we were uh, at the end of the Mezzadria, so uh, many areas that now are very famous were not planted to buy, to buy me, you know, mm -hmm. because as you said perfectly at the beginning, the, the first goal for each Mezzadro was to make a living, you know, <laughs> to, to buy shoes for the, for, uh, for, for the children. You know, to buy food for the children. So the vines, the, the vineyards were the vineyard was important, but was important to to add animals, cows, pigs, and, and so on. And uh, that's why another point. Many people now say, "Oh, but in, in this place, uh, the, the Nobbiolo was was not traditionally planted. There were in the Dolcetto and Barbera." Oh yes, uh, that's true, but we have every time to remember uh, what was important at that time, you know, uh, because to sell grapes, uh, the, the Barolo at that time was not so famous as now. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was easier for them to plant the Dolcetto and Barbera and sell these grapes and earn much more money, you know. So yeah. every time we have to uh, put everything in the context. And this is uh, very important. Coming to other other areas, uh, you know, for example, in Monte Pulciano, uh, there is, or in Orvieto as well, there is not such a tradition of single vineyard. And my first uh, idea was to pick up the traditional names because there are always in every place except sometimes in California, because in Napa Valley, when I, when I started to map in Napa Valley with Antonio Galloni, I suppose, okay, I take the maps, uh, the old maps from USGS and so on, and I, I try to find out some, some place, name place, yeah. but there is almost nothing. In, in some places, there are a lot of place names. If you move uh, five miles to the north or to the south, all because you know in Italy uh, a mountain each mountain each hill each snow uh, as a name yeah everywhere every creek as a name if you go to Napa Valley there are a lot of unnamed creek uh, for me it was a real surprise but I let's go back to Italy and, yeah and for example in in in, in Monte Pulciano, the first step was to take this traditional name that you can find on the map, check this name with the producer, with, but not every time with the producer, because sometimes it's, it's important to, to go to the, to, to, to the bar and ask the people, ask the local people about some names and compare their opinion with the, with the opinion of the producer. This is always really important. And this is something that I love so much to do. Uh, when I go to, to an area to listen to the people uh, that are that all the other people do not uh, do not care about you know and uh, and that's why uh, when I go when I make a map of a region I go to each producer from the most famous producer to the most humble producer yeah. and for me <clears throat> the opinion of those people are on the same level uh, and, and this is my way to work when I, when I, but I don't know why I started to talk about this, but <laughs> anyway. Well, uh, I asked you about cultural heritage, you know, I asked you to, to, to yes, explain yes, it. You know, process, but, so yeah. 
Yeah, the, the, a place name is a cultural heritage. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's obvious in my opinion. So uh, if this small church is called San Damiano or something else, uh, this is important to take this name and place this name on the map. Because, you know, uh, if we look at the 90s and we look at the wine market in Italy now, uh, many things are changing. You know, there are economical interests <laughs> in, in the middle. And uh, 30 years ago, uh, the people, not only the wine producer, but everybody uh, was more uh, straightforward. If, mm. if they want, if they said what, what was true, what was normal for them. Now, uh, you know, there are some economical interest in the middle. <laughs> so uh, maybe if this crew uh, okay, was considered like this one, you know, a small crew, now yeah. is a little bit larger. But this is not only in Italy. Eh? I have to say this is, this is all around the world. If you go, if you go to Bordeaux or yeah. Burgundy, I, I suppose that if in Burgundy, they would make another delimitation, or if they want, they would make a delimitation. Now it was, it would be <laughs> very, 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 very difficult. You know, yeah. in Bordeaux, you know perfectly what happened some years ago in Saint Emilion. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a perfect example of economical interest. In well, we see that in in Bourgogne, the place that we see that is in Chablis. Yeah, the, this expansion. In the rest, in, in the Cote d'Or, there's nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But yeah, so it is everywhere, certainly. If you if they can, people I, will. Not either <laughs> alone, so. Yeah. Um, this is so wonderful, and I, I, I'm so interested in, in the place names and, and, and all of that, but I want to talk about the physical, pro you know, products um, a little bit, and how your maps are different than other maps. Um, you'll notice yeah. I have your topographical map on the wall, but I do not have any paper maps on my walls, because they have two sides. Yes, so can you tell us a little bit about why and how we use them and Yes, yeah. that, that's the point. I'm really happy that you uh, get this point because it's very important to me. Because uh, when I produce a map, sometimes people look at the map and say, oh, it's, it's only a map. Why, <laughs> why is it so expensive to, be, to make a map? Yeah, uh, it's not only a map. Because now with the, with the tools that you have on, on any computer, uh, almost everybody can make a good map and maybe uh better than mines uh, but what is important is is the back of the map is is the description of how this map has been created so why uh, for example in montepulciano some areas has been delimited by me why if, even if there is no official delimitation so mm -hmm. it's important to explain uh, why you uh, draw a boundary in a particular place and not 100 meters to the right or 100 meters to the to the to the to the left? And this is that's why uh, I say every time to the people who buy my maps, please look at the map of the map because sometimes people look at the map and start to uh, uh, ask question, um, and I say. Uh, please, have you read the, the guide for readers, for example? <laughs> Very simple, it's on the front. No, I have not read the, the guide for readers, so please read <laughs> this small piece of paper because even the, the guide for readers, for me, is extremely important. It takes, uh, to me, it takes uh, maybe uh, a day to write, to write only a few lines yeah. because I want to, play, to put in these lines all the most important point to, uh, that are useful to understand the, 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 the work that the, there is behind, is behind this, this, this map. So, uh, because uh, for example, even if in, in, in maps like uh, 
like uh, Montepulciano, where on the front you have the 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 the, the, the breakdown, the producer breakdown, but no delimitation of the areas. If you go to the back side, to the back of the map, you have a detailed description of, of all the different areas. And I hope that this, in, of course, in, in Barolo it was not was not the case, but in the Montepulciano in other areas, I hope that in the future, this uh, description will be useful uh, to create uh, uh, an official map of, of the area, uh, to give some suggestions, some 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 inspiration uh, to make a, a, an official limitation yeah yeah um you i used your map a lot with in my work in orvieto and yeah. um for me trying to understand the um the soil the complexity yeah. of the his, of the soil and geology in orvieto and the sensory impact on the wines as a result your map was essential to me in my work. And so I want to, I'm, I'm interested in this idea we talked about tasting and all of the things that we smell and the flowers and whatever is a personal reference, but the structure in the mouth is, you know, there's this, you know, kind of newish term out there, geosensorial tasting, this idea that this comes from the soil and the site and the aspect and so I find your maps very useful in questing to understand this kind of identity imprint based on yeah. the place. Yeah, Orvieto was a very challenging area, but I love that area because uh, the differences in geology and soils is so evident. So, and, and, and even the landscape, because the word the landscape, as we will see later with the 360 uh, website, uh, is is the guideline is the cornerstone in my work because the landscape can help you to understand a lot of things about the microclimate, about the soils, about the geology, uh, and so it is very very important to take the time to uh, learn to read the landscape because uh, we will see uh, within Barolo uh, if you look at the shape of some hills is perfectly clear that these hills are made prevalently of clay because yeah. clay create a certain shape of the hill and sand create a different, completely different uh, uh, shape of the hill. But even, even, even the, 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 the vegetation, you know, because uh, some kind of, 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 plant, uh, of plants um, do not uh, grow on certain soils, you know, um, you know, azimuths or some other, uh, you can plant these varieties only on some, only on some places. So if, if or in Montepulciano is quite typical, uh, there are some areas where there are no vegetation at all. Yeah. Uh, and from a point, from a, from a certain point on, you start to have vegetation and you say, why? It is more or less the same elevation, more or less the same microclimate. Okay, there is a big change in soil. So certain, certain kind of vegetation of certain soils cannot grow. And yeah. on the other side, uh, there is another soil and you have the vegetation. So but it's, this is uh, quite complex to it. <laughs> I, I love that you connect actually, um, I never specifically thought about it, but it seems so obvious now that you say it, the idea that the soil structure creates the shape of the hill, which means the aspect and the way that sunlight reaches the, the vines is affected by the soil type as well. Um, not just the way that the soil is, you know, heat retentive or drained or whatever else, but the whole thing is a package together. It's quite beautiful idea. Yeah, but there, there is another point uh, about soil and geology. Uh, sometimes many professionals uh, take a, a geological map and start to make some uh, idea about the wine style and so on. Yeah. But it's really important to understand that in some region like Barolo, a little less in Chianti Classico, but uh, there is a big difference between the soil, the subsoil, and the soil. Mm -hmm. so, 
the soil is descriptive by uh, sorry the subsoil is descriptive by 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 geology uh, but in many cases uh, the roots of the vines do not reach the subsoil remain in the soil so yeah. what is important is the soil uh, two days ago i, I saw on, on facebook uh, a picture of <laughs> Uh, from Champagne, you know, uh, there was a big hole in the soil showing the, 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 the white rock uh, in, in the subsoil and then uh, the soil, um, 50 centimeters of soil and the, 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 the word about, about this picture was, oh, look at, at the, the, the main characteristic of our soil uh, pointing at the, at the white soil uh, yeah. underneath. Sorry, but in that case, it's not it's not important because what is important is the one meter of soil that you have <laughs> uh, over this subsoil. Yeah. And so this is really important. And another, I want to come back to the, to the landscape because I know because I've been a wine taster for twenty five years and also a cereal wine taster for twenty five for twenty five years, and I know perfectly how it works. So when you are in a wine region, you drive the car from one cellar to another. Every time, look at the at, at, at the at the um, uh, orologio. Or yeah, watch. A watch. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm in late. I have to drive faster, faster. I'm in late. Huh? And you arrive at the end of the day, and you say, uh, "So where I, where I am? I, I don't know." Yeah, you, <laughs> you have never looked at the hills. You you. Maybe uh, you do not even know if it, if it is flat or or a nearly area. So my uh, advice, my suggestion is that when you go to a wine region, take the time to look around you, stop somewhere, and try to understand the landscape, and then go to a, to a wine producer. Uh, wine tasting is not the only things that can allow you to understand the wine. Uh, you have to understand where you are, where, where the wine comes from. That's the point. <laughs> That's perfect, actually, moment for us to zero in on a specific place, which is Barolo, which is um, at our tasting. So let's let's go there. Um, okay. We have. So I would like to invite you now to um, go ahead and share your screen, and I want to look at the 360 tool because, um, you know, actually, while you're doing that, I'll point out on the topographical map, at the very bottom of the topo map, um, we see actually this chart here. And I don't know if, if everybody can see, let me make sure everyone can see me. Um, I want to stop the share of screen. No, don't stop. I'm okay. gonna do, there we go. Um, so down here, this chart actually gives information of color coding about the soil types on the topographical, and then also describes the soil and the subsoil um, and its pH and calcareous nature and things like that. So there's so much information on this map. Um, you know, I find that over years, I find new layers of thinking about, you know, the map itself as, um, you know, as I explore the different regions. So it's, it's really fun not to not to miss this. Um, and some days you interact with it quite simply and some days, you know, there's a different way of interacting with it. But you've created this tool, which is, you know, it, it's, it's this, but it's real for us. It's so exciting. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That, because this is the point. Uh, because when you make a map, when you, when you write an article, when you make a book, uh, okay, you can make a map, you can make a 3D map uh, that looks fine, that, that is useful, but then you have to guess the reality, <laughs> okay? Uh, if, if you have never been to Barolo or Chianti Classico, you have to, you have to try to imagine uh, how, uh, which is the reality. And yeah. this website, this is the reality. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is the point. And uh, I want to say something more about the, the geology, and uh, because usually uh, uh, we we believe that the geology is the only answer to the style of the wine, and it's not so, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's true in some other region, 
where other factors are less important. But in a region like Barolo, as you can see, there are different differences in exposure that are really significant here, for example, in Chueco, in Brunater, but even here in every corner of the region. And the, the, the change in elevation you can see here is 1800 feet, the highest point of, 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 of uh, Barolo. So the lower part is uh, 200 meters. So yeah. it's almost the half. So as you, as you, as you can imagine for the grape variety, uh, is, is really is a very important factor. So it's important to remember so that uh, the geology in a region like Barolo is important. I'm really proud of this, of that map, maybe even more proud than uh, the other maps because this is really something unique, yeah. uh, the geological map that, uh, because behind this work, this geological work was the goal to to give the producer a tool uh, that helps them to use the same language. Yeah. And, and this is really important in every places in the world, because as far as in my experience uh, in, in California, in, in, in Italy, wherever, if you go to one spot, one specific hill, and for the first time with one producer and you ask them, oh, tell me about the soil. Uh, he, gives a, he gives you a description. Then you go there with another producer and you make the same, and you ask the same question. And I'm quite sure that you will receive a completely different answer. <laughs> yeah. And, but this is why they have no common language. And this is so in geology, in my opinion, is important to, to use the same words, the same language. Uh, for example, here in, 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 in um, Barolo, but even in Tuscany, it's quite common to use the word tufo, okay? Mm -hmm. And you know, tufo, because you love Orvieto, tufo is a volcanic stone, you yeah. know? And so here is a marine soil. <laughs> so there is no volcanic soil here, but it's common to yeah. use the word tufo. And yeah. so uh, if, you, if, if they use the word tufo with someone that usually, uh, that knows perfectly that tufo is a volcanic, it's, you know, it's confusing because they start to say, oh, but there is volcanic in Barolo? Yeah. No, it's not so. And, and even in, 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 in the southern part of Chianti Classico, in Castelnuovo, Ardenga, San Giusto, Arentanano, that part, uh, there is, uh, there are banks of, 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 of yellow sand and they used to call the sand tufa. And this is the right. sand that is used to pave the track of during the Palio di Siena, you know, the, that yellow sand. But anyway, let's go back. Let's oh, go back. I've, I found that, you know, reading, uh, you know, all so many, my Italian is only so-so, but I can read a little better than I understand. All of this diversity of the word tufo, tufa, um, can be, you know, just warning to everybody, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, well, we can talk about it another time, but everybody put a little warning on that word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, as I said before, this is the reality. And yeah. it, it's a different way to use the drone because uh, usually uh, the drones are used to shoot video and uh, there are fantastic, you know, because are spectacular, but usually they lack information, you yeah. know? So you have to look at, uh, at the video for five minutes, stay there, look at the video, oh, it's nice, 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 nice. You, you, you go to the end of the video and say, oh, so and, and, and now, now and you say, oh, there was something interesting, uh, but I don't know how to remember where and when. So you start to use the timeline desperately to look for this point, and then you say, okay, uh, no, uh, it doesn't care. I'm you guilty. Know? I do a screen, I'll go back and screenshot. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but in this case, uh, uh, you, are, you are not a passive, a user, you are you are an active user because you can turn the, these images as you prefer. 
So yeah. in this case, for example, we, we, we have no time to show everything uh, because there are there's a lot of things in this website. But for example, this, this picture has been shooted at the top of Castiglione Falletto. You, you can see Castiglione Falletto here at the bottom. So you are in the middle of the appellation. Yeah. And you can see, for example, how this area, okay, is completely different from uh, the landscape point of view and from this part of oh, yeah. the appellation. You can see this is the valley between Serralunga and Monforte. As you can see, is a is a, um, a rectilinear, is, is a straight valley, is a narrow valley. So the microclimate is completely different from this area, from this one, because this is wider. This is as a kind of a bowl. So this is in this area in the middle, you have uh, most 90%, uh, 80% of the most precocious cruise of the area because of the micro of the microclimate and because of the shape of the area. And again, if you look, I try to use this. If you look more or less here, okay, you can see that the hills are rounded hills, are rolling hills. If you look in the, oh, sorry. Oh, mamma mia. It's okay, don't worry. <laughs> okay. If you look here, the landscape is completely different. There are no rolling, rolling hills. The, the, the slopes are steeper. And why? As I said before, the soil, and the geology are completely different. Here you have more sand. Sand more means erosion, mm -hmm. so deeper slopes. Uh, in this area you have more clay here, so rounded hills. Mm -hmm. So why is important? That's that's a point. It, it is important to understand uh, the, the the landscape. And again, uh, on, on the map that you have on the back, the geological 3D map that you have. There are some brown areas, okay, some brown areas, okay. These are the Arenari di Diano, the Diano sandstones. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the landscape, again, you can see this part with a lot of wood, another woods yeah. here at the top of the ridge, okay. Why? These are, these are the outcrops of the Arenari di Diano. <laughs> and that's why you have the, the woods at the top, because uh, in this area, the Arenari di Diano can come to the surface. And so the, 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 the slope is so steep that you cannot plant any vineyards. So that's why you have woods up there. <laughs> and so you can perfectly uh, see where the Arenari di Diano are, you know? Mm. That's why that's why this this tool, in my opinion, is is is, is important. Because, but I I believe that it's better to move to to the wines because I yep. see that we have only fifteen Let's minutes. Go. Yeah, so. we can go a little bit over if we need to. That's okay. <laughs> Yes, um, yeah. Nobody's going to cut us off. But yeah, so let's zero in on these wines, and we can look at the. Yeah, exactly. So beautiful. You can see how Alessandro is using this tool, and I'm going to give you guys a discount code later too if you want to sign up um, to you know to have access and membership to this tool um, he's pulled up exactly um Kenubi, which we're going to taste first so that we can look at it's such a large crew uh with so many different it looks, it looks large yeah. but it's not so large because we have larger crews like busia but uh um, for example, Canubi and Brunate are more or less the same extension. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what is important is the is where Canubi is placed. Uh, as you can see, is right in the middle of that bowl that I mentioned before. Yeah. So that's why Canubi is one of the most precocious uh, early ripening sites inside the Appalachian. It's not, it's not the most uh, precocious because Brunate and Cerecchio are, are warmer. But anyway, uh, this is one of the reasons why in the past and now as well, Canubi is so famous yeah. because 
when in the 70s, in the 60s, in the 50s, when the climate was different, it was really important to have an early ripening crew, you know, because it, it uh, because you were uh, you can you can uh, pick up the, the grapes before the the rainfall, you know, and so it was really in, important to have an uh, early ripening crew, and uh, we have uh, I have I have the, the vintage 2014, and you have 12 and 14, so uh, maybe it's is it's not so easy to make a comparison between the two crews because remember uh, when you when you have to make a comparison between different areas it's important to have the same uh, the same vintage and in this case we have a cold vintage like 2014 and a warmer vintage a vintage like 2012 okay but anyway i want to show you where this wine come from and i want to so let me just i i want to know but i want to um, do a little bit backup basic for um those who are tasting along um so damiano is one of the more historic producers they were established in 1890 so they really as far as i understand them represent kind of in some ways the best of of the traditional knowledge and forward thinking you know in terms of of um questing to create terroir oriented wines, um, but they also have that long um, traditional knowledge as well. And so we're tasting in, in Seattle right now, we're able to taste Kanubi 2014 um, and Cherokee uh, 2012. So um, Alessandro has both 2014. Uh, so that is what he's referring to. Oh, today. Sorry. Uh, uh, so you have a 14 a Kanubi and 12 Cherokee. Yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. It's better. It's better. It's better. Okay, better. I, I thought the opposite. Okay, no, it's much better. It's much Great. better. So yeah. now, now you can show us. <laughs> because, because, because the 12 and the Kanubi can make Kanubi more similar to Cherokee. Mm, I see. The 12 on Cherokee makes Kanubi, uh, make, make Cherokee even more different from Kanubi. So it's perfect. It's Good. Perfect. Great. Thank Great. you. Uh, so this is this, the historical, the central part of the Kanubi Hill, what is called now Kanubi MGA, uh, because the Kanubi Hill is now divided in different uh, MGA. You have Kanubi Valletta, you have Kanubi Muscatel, Kanubi San Lorenzo, and Kanubi Boskis. Uh, and you can make uh, Kanubi uh, from this central part and call this one Kanubi, but you can make a Kanubi also blending the, this, uh, the, um, I come back to, to, to this image. You can make a Kanubi also by blending uh, different area, areas inside the hill. Um, it's not a problem for me, I have to say, uh, because the style of the wine in particular from this part up to Kanubi Valletta is quite similar in my, in my opinion. Then anyway, you can see this, part that Milano is the yellow one, then you have uh, another part here of, uh, of the Milano. But if we look at this, oh, let me see, I want to show. Now this is the, because it's important to remember that uh, Kanubi has a south facing part and a, and a northern facing part. This is the northern side. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I wanted to show you, oh, the Kanubi Valletta. And anyway, I go back to this one. Uh, all this part here, more or less, I, I, I used I used the, the pencil. Uh, more or less, this part of Kanubi Valletta also is in the end of Da Milano. So, okay. uh, if you put everything together, it is the larger estate in, inside inside the Kanubi Hill, mm. and uh, the Kanubi. Uh, as you said before, and is, this is important, uh, when you taste, when you, when you make a comparison between different crews in Barolo, it's better to focus on the mouth because uh, is is the is the way the the, the acidity shows or the tannin uh, goes on the mouth that make the differences. And in this case, Kanubi, if you taste the 2014, is a typical Kanubi because is 
Usually Canubi is not, except for some vintages, is not a very powerful wine, is, is an elegant wine. Uh, but if you make a comparison, for example, with another elegant cruise like Rocca di Castiglione, it's not so fruity, okay? They have more or less the same exposure uh, because they are southeast facing vineyards, but in, in uh, um, the Canubi is a little bit more austere and you can feel this character in the tannin because um, in a young wine like this one, at the end of the, of, of the tasting, you have uh, the tannin that is a little bit harder compared to the, to the Chiraquio that we will taste later on. And um, so I want to show you, just to, just to give you, oh, let me stop this. So uh, just to go back here and talk about, um, oh, good. Oh, I this think is, you're going there, yeah. <laughs> this is the geological map. Yeah. So why usually Canubi is an elegant wine? Uh, because if you look here, I use this. All this area is a sandy area. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, as you know, sand usually do not give structure, a big structure to the, the wine, it gives more elegance. Uh, this, uh, for this formation is called Marne di Sant'Agata Fossili. You have actually, you have different kind of uh, Sant'Agata Fossili Mars. You have the typical one in the lower part, but in the upper part where the vineyards of the Milano are, you have the sandy type of, 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 of uh, Sant'Agata Fossili Mars. And you have some little outcrops here, for example, and here of Arenare di Diano, that is even more sandy, okay, as, as, as the soil. And um, while if you look here at the Cerequio, you have at the top, you have the um, laminated Sant'Agata fossili Mars, while, while at the bottom you have the here, the uh, typical Sant'Agata fossili Mars. But what is even more important in Cerequio is the difference between the south facing side and the, and the east facing side. Because mm -hmm. as you can see here, there is a, a dotted uh, a, a, a pattern that tells you that, that in this side of the hill, you have evoluted soil. I, we have no time to explain the difference between the differences between young soil and evoluted soils, but just to give you some information. And uh, I stop this and I go back uh, and I'm, so this is, so this is uh, uh, just to, just to give you an idea, take a look at this map as a uh, picture as well. As you can see, uh, there are, in the Canubi, it's very typical, there are many uh, amphi little amphitheaters where the exposure changes a lot, so changes from south to east. So yeah, even this is important in the area. And maybe it's better to move to the Chorequio because we have only five minute, minutes left. Yeah. And let's take, let's look at it, and then we can talk a little bit about how they're structured differently. Yes. Oh, so this is so this is Chirepio, uh, a fantastic place. Canubi is fantastic as well. But this play, this part of the hill is one of my favorites. Uh, Chirepio and Brunate on this side are really great crews at the same level, in my opinion. What is completely mysterious to me in Cerequio is why the wines coming from this part of the, of the cruise that faces east and the wines coming from here that's, that is south facing are more or less the same, <laughs> more or less the same style because you expect from the wine coming from the eastern side of the cruise, like of the crew, like the Cherequio, to have a more fruity character, a crispy acidity, while uh, it's not so usually. And Cherequio is, is warmer, rounder, and full-bodied compa compared to uh, the Canubi. And maybe in the future, we can, we can make a comparison between uh, Cerecchio and Brunate, 
and this is very uh, useful as well uh, to make this comparison. If you have, if you have the time to, if you can find two bottles of the same vintage of, of, the, of the two of the two crews uh, to make a comparison, because Brunate, you as you can see, there is only 100 meters from here to there. Okay, it's, but the wines are completely different. The yeah. soil are the same. Uh, the exposure, so Brunate is a little bit more to the south, but anyway, it's not, it's not significant. So the soil are the same, the exposure is more or less the same, but the Brunate is completely different. It's more tannic, it's more austere, has more or less the same structure, but the tannins, the tannins on the mouth are completely different. And uh, so I think- in, in your opinion, what is the, what is the cause of this? I, 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 can I cannot tell you, hmm. I, I, I have no explanation at all, uh, because I, I want to show you the geological yeah. map. Take a look at the map. This is Brunate, okay? Brunate is cut exactly in the middle. This is the boundary. Here you have the laminated Mars. Here you have the typical Mars. Tunicum is exactly the same. Hmm. is cut in the middle by the boundary between the two kinds of Mars. So the exposure is more or less the same. Yes, Brunati is a little bit more to the south. The soil is the same. The elevation is even the same. You know, the difference yeah. in elevation between the top and the bottom of Brunati is the same, more or less the same as in Cherequio. But the wines are different. <laughs> this is the magic of wine, <laughs> you know. Uh, the you have every time to to learn to leave something unexplained. I, in my, in my, <laughs> sometimes yes, you ask question. You, you can ask a question and you find an answer, and sometimes you don't. And yeah, it's we're still going to ask the questions. <laughs> in, my, in my opinion, is not so important. Yeah, it's not necessary to have an answer every yeah. time to the question. <laughs> Certainly, yeah, but there has to be some mystery in the world. As we'll far, never get as, bored. as far as wine is concerned, of course, uh, <laughs> in, in other fields, in other uh, subjects, is is important to have an answer every time. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about wine. <laughs> yes, we are. That's what we're interested in here. So yeah, it's so. Let's talk about the difference between these two wines. Um, right off the bat, um, you know, first of all, we have I have a difference in vintage, which means that I've got more tertiary aromas on the 2012. But besides yeah. that, if we're just talking about structure, um, certainly the Kanubi is is much more kind of elegant and um, and fine. Uh, yes, but at the same time, look at the, at the tannins in the mouth on the 14th. You have this tannin on the border uh, of the mouth that is quite typical of, of a younger canoe. They're very tight. Yes, if you go to Valletta, it's more, the, it's more or less the same, the same style. While if you taste the Cherequio, I have the 2014, but this, the difference is very, very evident. You have not this kind of tannin. It, this mm -hmm. one is warmer is rounder. Mm. And for example, uh, is the, you, can, you can find this, this same style if you compare the Brunate from Roberto Boerzio with, with the Giorecchio from Roberto Boerzio. Mm -hmm. uh, Giorecchio every time has this style, rounder style, softer time, uh, yeah. tannin, and more, more velvety. Uh, yeah. If I can use this 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 word, there exactly there there seems to be more uh, the tannin is 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 more drying and more pervasive, but it's definitely um, the texture of the tannin is larger or um, than the, in the canoe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. And usually, I do not. I'm not interested in in aromas in in on the nose. But I have to say that in these two bottles, uh, there is also a big differences, big difference between the Canubi and Cherequio on the nose. Yeah. Uh, the 14, 
I, I, I poured the wine one year, uh, one hour ago, and now you have a floral note uh, on the nose that is fantastic. That is not easy to find in a, in a younger uh, canoe because uh, when a canoe, when in a, in a younger canoe, always the nose is is closed, is a little bit closed when it when it's young, and in this case it it open up, it opens up. In, in, in a floral note, it, this is really uh, the, the nose of a nebbiolo. And the, the, the Cherokee to me feels more, more earthy. I definitely get rose and floral on it as well, but mixed with, with, a, uh, with a greater earthiness, a little bit for aromas. This, this, this could be connected uh, to the vintage, maybe. Mm -hmm. What do you find yeah, in your wine? Yeah, warmer yeah. vintage. Uh, well, in in my in my bottle is not is not so so mm -hmm. maybe the 2012 vintage gives this kind of of character. Yeah, because yeah. it was a little bit warmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So interesting. Um, so I think that now actually, um, you know, this wasn't a, a tasting class. We wanted to just kind of give an idea of how we might use a little bit the mapping and the tools to. Um, to talk about the structure of the wine. And um, I wanna open up to a couple minutes of questions for Alessandro, um, if I can. So you can, we can, let's see, I'm gonna open up my chat. You can leave your tool up. And um, if people wanna go ahead and type in questions in the chat box, um, then Alessandro can answer them. And I guess um, as far as, Oh, while we're waiting for people to come up with questions, I have a question for you about what you're working on now. I think this will interest Americans. You already alluded to a California project. And um, is that the main thing you're working on right now? I mean, obviously with with our pandemic, you're, that is probably interrupting your work on that subject. <laughs> so, uh, fortunately, in my, in my case, uh, the pandemic was not a great problem. It, it was only a problem because you, you cannot travel. This is the only point. Uh, from the professional point of view, is a, uh, the last year has been a, a fantastic year. And many opportunities, mm. many ideas, many, many, many projects. And the 2021 as well. And I hope 20, uh, 2022. <laughs> and so I'm working on so many projects. I want to make this website grow up for sure. I want to add some more features uh, in, in, in the future. I'm working on, on, on the Barbaresco 360 as, as well. Mm -hmm. I'm working in Chianti Classico or more or less on, on, a, on the same project. I'm working with Antonio in Napa. So, uh, I have to make the new edition of Barbaresco. So I'm working in Francia Corta, so sparkling wines. Uh, mm -hmm. and from a from a landscape point of, a land, landscape point of view, but uh, also from uh, from an historical point of view, because the Francia Corta has a fantastic um, uh, tradition of um, place name. And oh. because the, 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 there is a, a Napoleonic cadastre, a cadastre, a cadastre, yeah. cadastre with wow. every single par parcel as a name. And for me, it was like a, a, a baby, it was like to be a baby with, uh, with a room full of candies. I can imagine. <laughs> oh, that's so exciting and, and really kind of unprecedented to think about. You know, m most people don't focus as much on uh, terroir soil mapping for sparkling wine. So that, that's really an interesting project. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, it's, it was my, one of my favorite projects in, in the last 10 years, mm. because it was, it was really a surprise. I, I did uh, a work similar to this one, only in 94 when I did the map of Barbaresco, because even in that case, uh, I started from the Napoleonic cadastre, uh, because it was available in the, in the, in the, in the township, and in the um, local um, biblioteca of, uh, anyway, where you, where you store the books. 
So I, I found this old book with all with the maps, with the name of the owners of each, of each single parcel. Uh, it was it was a dream for me. And after 25 years to find uh, another uh, region with the same level of information was really amazing. So this is another project. That's so exciting. Maybe we can later on we can come on and, and talk about that because um, all the place names is something that that tintillates me. You know, I would like I would like to show you a preview of the map, but I cannot because uh, it's a top secret project. Okay, <laughs> I'll trust you. You'll show it to us when you're ready, Kathleen. Um, <laughs> Kathleen has a question. Kathleen Murdoch of Rare Wine Company. Hello, oh, Kathleen. Hi. First up, thank you so much to Tanya and Alessandro for making today possible. It was really great um, hearing both of you. Tanya giving a little history and Alessandro showing um, how to use the 360 tool. I thought it was really great. Um, and one thing that uh, struck me, Alessandro, is um, when you were talking about the Kanubi Vineyard, you were saying that one of the reasons why it became so well known is because it pretty consistently made great wines. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, in these years of global warming that we have, you know, what vineyards do you see is emerging is kind of, you know, kind of um, diamonds in the rough, if you will, or, or just not as maybe in the past they, weren't consistently making great wines, but now since we have consistently warm vintages. So, um, thanks so much for the question, because for sure we are living a particular era. Uh, so the, the climate changing is obvious. Uh, we experience every day this kind of changing. But at the same time, I'm sure that the historical cruise will remain historical and top cruise even in the future. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure uh, because uh, first of all, the producer have learned to manage with this kind of new vintages, so warmer vintages. So they, they, they work in the vineyard in a different way compared to the past. So if you take, for example, 2017, that everybody says, oh, it's a warm vintage, uh, too, 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 too dry. In my opinion, it's maybe it's, of course, it's not top vintage. It's not, it's not the, the, uh, the 2016, of course. But in my opinion, it's a good vintage. And as far as I have not tasted all the wines, but you cannot feel overripe uh, notes in this wine. While if you remember the 2003 Barolos and Barbaresco, there were a lot of wine with a taste of overripe fruit. And the vintages are more or less the same. Temp was very dry 2003, very warm 2003. What has changed in the middle? The, the producer that have learned to work in this kind of, of, of vintages. So in my opinion, the top cruise will remain top cruise even in the future. And of course, some other crews that were, are less known will are emerging, okay? But, uh, some people say that in the future there will be a revolution. So the less known cruise will be the best one and the historical cruise will be lower in quality. I don't think so, <laughs> actually. And this is a, I am not a technician. I am not an agronomist, but in my opinion, I think that the vines are adapting to this <laughs> different microclimate. Remember that is, uh, a vine is like, is like a human being, okay? So if human being animals are able to adapt themselves 
to a climate change, of course, not like dinosaur, of course, <laughs> not such a big, such a huge climate change, but small changes or gradual changes as we are experiencing now. Uh, if I repeat, if human beings and animals are able to adapt, why <coughs> the mind is not able to adapt uh, itself to this changing? And in my opinion, in some cases, vines are adapting a little bit mm. to this changing. It, it is a bit their superpower, the, the <laughs> Vitis vinifera, to adapt to its place, you know, in particular. And that's why we have the importance of clones in, in the vineyard. And so it does kind of follow that why couldn't they also adapt to um, changing in uh, climate the, in the that clone. place? Yes, the, clone, the clones is another story. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, we have uh, we yeah. need five hours. To we, talk about we will. Everything. We'll have to uh, reconvene another time on on clones. You, would you, be a wonderful. You, you, yeah. You can find all. You can find all these uh, um, ref ideas in the volume two of Barolo, where I describe in detail all these steps. But remember that we started to select clones at the end of the eighties. And at the end of the 80s, the climate was another kind of climate. So we, the, the, uh, the goal, the objective of the selection of clones at that time was to select a clone that was an early ripening one, <laughs> okay? And because we didn't know that the climate was changing. So we are now, we are working with vineyards with, with the warmer climates and early ripening clones. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so uh, it was we not have to adapt together. <laughs> but you know, you, you cannot you cannot see the future. So the 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 the, the, the goal at that time was to have to have early ripening clones. So maybe now we will work on different clones. But I, I believe that we don't need the different clones because uh, the producer demonstrated that they are able to adapt their work to different conditions, different climatic conditions. So I am really uh, co confident in the future, definitely. It's such, an it's such an exciting subject and it really kind of brings full circle this idea that really um, for a lot of Americans, we think of the old world, we think uh, as, as something that's so established and so unchanging and, you know, hopefully a little bit through this conversation and, you know, future explorations, we can understand even the most, uh, his, one of the most historic wines of Italy is dynamic and um, there's, and fresh, and there's yeah. a lot of change and constantly mm -hmm. being forced to adapt and investigate and it's not static at all. Um, and, this is, and, and in my opinion, this is the main point of Morolo because producer and along 30 years of history have demonstrated the, 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 their ability to uh, think about everything they do and change uh, along the way. And so uh, that's why, in my opinion, Barolo is so good now, is so famous because uh, this is due, of course, to the region, to the grape variety that is beautiful, but, but if you don't have a uh, producer at the same level of the, of, the re, of the soils, exposure and so on, you cannot reach the same result. So uh, the producer are very, very, very important in Barolo and their way for things about the wine, to compare their wines with other wines, to see what the other people are doing around the world, Oh, it's fantastic. So uh, the, the real force, in my opinion, now in Barolo are the producer. That's, that's for of, sure. Of course, it's the, it's the human collaboration with nature. This is, the, this is the writing of the story that we're reading, you know, as consumers and tasters. And it, it, thank you so much, Alessandro, for this wonderful time together. Um, for those of you who are tasting and watching, I am going to send out um, a 
discount code to a uh, 10 euro discount for the annual membership on Barolo MGA 360 and also a link to connect you to all of the maps and products that you can purchase through Rare Wine Company here in the United States. Um, thanks to Kathleen and Alessandro, I hope that we'll have um, many future conversations. This has been such a gift. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. <laughs> Have Ciao. a good evening. Ciao. Yeah, thank you so much. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.